Welcome everyone to what is the first and what may very well be the last video blog entry for EdTech Researcher. My name is Justin Reich and I want to show you some of the research that I've been doing here in the world of Minecraft. So for months now I've been hearing educators talking about using Minecraft and hearing a lot of parents having some really interesting conversations about what it means for their kids to be playing Minecraft and using this as a, as a recreational space and a community space and a social space and a learning space. So I thought I'd explore it a bunch for myself. Uh, we're here at my spawn point. This is where I was created in my Minecraft world. Many folks probably know this, but Minecraft uh, is sort of two things at once. In, in part, it's a block building game. So everything in the world you can see is made of blocks. These are some dirt blocks that I can grab. There are some uh, sand blocks down here. There are some tree blocks over here. And if I break up blocks, I can collect them, and then I can take those blocks and I can use those blocks to build things. So the fundamental mechanic is to take blocks, remove them, and move them around. Blocks are made of different characteristics. These are some tree blocks. And I can take these tree blocks and turn them into different things. So I can take this one block and I can turn it into planks. I can take these planks and I can turn them into sticks. I can take sticks and I can turn them into uh, the different kinds of things you see here, axes and swords and other kinds of things. And the reason why you'll need armor and swords and, and other kinds of tools is because at night there will be monsters that come out and try to kill you. The chickens that are here are pretty friendly. I can take these eggs, I can throw it at the chicken. Uh, the pigs are pretty friendly and can be harvested for meat and so forth. Uh, but the point is, through this really simple mechanic of taking pieces and adding them to other pieces, you can create different uh, elements, different places, different ideas of unlimited complexity. As uh, some folks have said, one of the genius of what Notch, the creator of Minecraft, has done is he's basically tricked a generation of millions of young kids into using a computer-assisted design program. So here's kind of the main base in the world that I've built. As you can see, I have a kind of evil wizard layer uh, aesthetic going on here. I've got a nice little farm of carrots for feeding my pigs. I have pumpkins for making jack-o'-lanterns that light up at night. I have melons. I have potatoes. I have all kinds of uh, agriculture over here. When you start the game, all of this doesn't exist, of course. You have to put different things together. And right now I have a really nice kind of uh, imperial basement where I've got my furnaces and my different equipment and things like that. I've got a basement down here where I grow mushrooms that I collected from another dimension. It's interesting to note that you don't actually have to grow mushrooms in the basement. It just sort of pleased me aesthetically to think that the mushrooms ought to be grown in the basement. And that, I think, connects to kind of the essential point of Minecraft there's not something that you're supposed to be doing. Sometimes it's described as a sandbox game. Uh, and in my sandbox, I thought it would be appropriate for the mushrooms to grow underground. So there they go. When you first start playing the game, you spend a lot of time sort of trapping yourself into little basements like this where you punch at stone blocks until you can break them up and turn them into pieces of stone that you can turn into axes and shovels and swords and things like that. Uh, of course, now I have much more uh, sophisticated or, or powerful equipment that can take these things and turn them into blocks almost instantly, but that's after many, many hours of research and exploration. So this is the basement where I hole up at night while there are zombie pigmen and skeleton archers and spiders and other kinds of things trying to kill me. And then during the day, you're trying, or one of the things that I do is try to collect enough food to survive. You can see that right now I'm I'm getting a little bit hungry here, so I better eat the, one of my steaks. There you go, now I feel better. So I was trying to figure out how I was going to show you the full sort of uh, space that I've created here. Here's my library. This is where I do some enchanting. I've got this really cool blue floor here of lapis lazuli, a forge where I repair things. You can see out that I've got some uh, railway lines that go out to other islands. Um, but I wanted to show you my agricultural space and so it occurred to me that one of the things that I would need to do is build a monorail uh, that went out over my uh, herds of sheep and pigs and uh, chickens and cows so you could all see them. And again I think this connects to one of the sort of critical ideas of Minecraft here that as a, as a sandbox there's nothing particular that I need to do. Um, 
And in a sense, what the game is, is a series of mini-games that I invented for myself. Uh, so at one point I decided that what I needed to have was a giant flock of multicolored sheep. And so I went around the world collecting sheep and bringing them here and feeding them so they'd reproduce and finding dyes from different all the parts of the world so they would reproduce themselves into different kinds of colors and then eventually I would have this kind of multicolored sheep farm. And that for me was a game that I wanted to play inside Minecraft. I've collected chickens, I've collected pigs, I have this giant herd of cows down here. One of the games that I just played there was hitting that switch on time so we could leave. Um, let me take you down here to see some of the some of the other things. One of the elements of Minecraft is it has a reasonably fully functional electrical system. So this red uh, stuff here is redstone. My cows are quite noisy. Uh, we'll deal with them in a minute. But you can see here that I have some wheat that's grown full, and you can see these odd-looking uh, faces here. And one of the things that I've designed is a system that uh, dispenses water out of all these different pieces and so it floods the fields and if you wait long enough all of the wheat and the seeds from the wheat get collected in a central trough allowing me to automatically harvest my wheat field and you can see there that I've just collected a full complement of uh, wheat and so I can take my wheat that I've just grown and go over to my cows here. Oops. A bunch of them are getting away. But I can run around now and I can start giving wheat to my cows and they'll reproduce themselves. You can see the little hearts that are floating up over their head as I give away the wheat. And then they start breeding little baby cows. All those little dings you hear are me earning experience points, which I'll be able to later convert into enchantments that I put on weapons. Um, if all this sounds a little complicated, it is. There's a whole system that's built inside a game like this. And really, systems is in some ways the central part of learning that people can get uh, out, of, uh, out of games like this. So we're, we're sort of overwhelmed here, and the cows are a little too close, so it's time to thin the herd. You can see as I thin my herd, my scientifically managed agricultural experience here, and I'm collecting raw meat and leather from them. Now there's, now there's a little more space for the baby cows to grow up. I try not to kill the baby cows, I try to let them grow up to become fully productive animals in their own society. But uh, sometimes you whack one by accident. It actually recalls uh, a famous game event in Ultima 4 uh, where there was a group, Ultima 4 was a, was a role-playing game that was, uh, some of you who are very, very old will remember, um, but one of the elements of Ultima 4, maybe it was Ultima 3, was that there was a group of children uh, who uh, would go crazy and attack you, um, and you had to make a decision at some point in the game whether or not you were going to kill the evil children that had appeared. Um, the uh, Since voluntary rating systems has been adopted, that didn't that kind of thing doesn't come up anymore, but it's one of the moral questions that appears. You know, is it is it morally wrong to kill an imaginary baby cow that doesn't actually really exist? Um, those are the kinds of questions that are evoked by people who spend time um, taking on a persona inside an imaginary world. Uh, there aren't really points inside this imaginary world. There aren't really levels inside the world. There's not really uh, an end to the game per se. There are some things that you can do that are harder than other things, but none of them will say, um, none of them will put a big thing across the screen which says you won. Um, the point of the game is just to play the game. So one of the first games that I invented myself when I started playing Minecraft was Find a Sheep. Um, so this is the world that I started on. You can see the sun setting behind it to the west. My moon will come up here some point eventually. And I decided that uh, it was disappointing that there were no sheep, which I knew existed in the game, in my world. And so I would go out and I built a boat and ventured across the great blue sea to try to find them. 
there's the moon rising over there uh, in the east. And so I put a giant boat across here, and, a, and I actually, it turns out, after traveling this whole enormous way, and the long train ride that we're on gives you some sense of the scale of the game. This is a tiny, tiny fraction of an infinitely wired world, um, and actually only a tiny fraction of the world that I've explored. But it gives you a little bit of a sense of, uh, of distance and time. So I rode a boat all this way out here, and when I stumbled across a new island, I actually didn't find a sheep. I found a cow. Uh, but uh, I decided a cow was good enough, and so I built this giant bridge that would bring the cow back. Um, the first couple cows actually lured back by walking them across. Eventually I built this whole railway system um, that would allow me to take cows and push them in mine carts um, and travel them back across the world. All of these features are kind of randomly generated except the ones uh, that, that you see that I've built. So these are hills up here. This is kind of a funny little chunk of land. There's a little bit of desert right here. Oh, there's a cow who's made his way. Hey! <laughs> there's a cow who randomly got in one of my carts. It's causing trouble. There's a skeleton archer. There's a creeper. He's going to try to blow me up. There's another creeper who will try to blow me up. There's a zombie pigman. So all these guys are trouble. Fortunately, I've built another little house here. So we'll come in here and rest for the evening. And resting means I'm safe. It sounds like there's a couple of monsters out here somewhere that are burning to death in the light, but they'll go away soon enough. So there's certainly some animated violence in the world, but the animated violence is uh, directed against non-human entities and relatively minor. Um, when I came here to find a sheep but didn't, and found a cow, I also found this giant hole in the ground here, so we can uh, explore one of the mines that I've built. Kind of like a roller coaster ride to get down to the bottom. Pretty cool kind of underground layer here. Some obsidian that I harvested for netherworld dimensions, a giant pit of lava which will burn me very quickly. I have a little underground layer here, some emergency supplies, an extra mine cart, some mushrooms, that sort of thing. Um, so there's this question that we can ask as we're zooming around, which is to what extent is all of this about learning? Now, what kinds of skills and capacities are people developing when they're playing in these kinds of spaces? Um, some of it seems to be uh, about creativity. I mean, if you believe that building things with blocks has some kind of educative value, then it seems to me that putting things together with imaginary blocks also has uh, educative value. Some of it's aesthetic, um, thinking about ideas of proportion, thinking about ideas of design, of appearance, of space, and so forth. Um, a lot of it is learning about a system. So what are the rules of the system? How long does it take for a zombie pigman in daylight to die? Uh, how many sword hits does it take to kill a creeper before he blows up and blows up all kinds of things around you? What kind of resistance does stone have to uh, creeper explosives as compared to sand or dirt or other kinds of elements? Um, as people play in these virtual worlds, part of what they're doing is figuring out how to develop a system. And of course, systems thinking is central to all kinds of different activities, uh, whether it's leadership and management and designing people and des designing activities that people do and designing workflows. Uh, I have a good friend, Doug Piachuk, an English teacher, who argues that understanding systems is essential for understanding satire and farce. You can't really understand how it is that, that you exaggerate uh, a system unless you can understand what the base of the system is to begin with. So the question is, is this an activity which is a good activity for kids? Um, one of the ways I can answer that question is to say, well, what kinds of things do I want for my own kids? And I'm certainly excited for my girls to grow up, and I hope Minecraft is still popular then, and I think it would be really fun um, to play and explore and build together inside these worlds with her. Uh, I 
I think there are more questions to be asked about what kinds of learning experiences can you build inside a formal environment. I think school is not well designed for playing Minecraft. Um, we've been here together about 15 minutes now and uh, probably too long for us to be talking together or me to be talking to you. But it's still a relatively short period of time, but that, that was half a class period and pretty much what I managed to do in half a class period uh, was walk around a little bit, show you uh, around and then take a train ride to my secondary base here. Uh, investing in learning systems, investing in creating art doesn't fit well within 53 minute periods. Uh, and so it's hard to say, when, when we ask the question is, is Minecraft a useful activity for schools, one of the things we have to ask is whether or not schools are well suited um, for activities that reward patience and perseverance like Minecraft. Is playing Minecraft more valuable than learning your times tables? Is playing Minecraft more valuable than learning to write a powerful sentence? Uh, I'm not sure, but I do think that uh, thinking about how we put worlds together, thinking about how we play in sandboxes, uh, is certainly a worthwhile activity. One of my colleagues, Douglas Keong, out in the Punahou School is experimenting with thinking about how Minecraft can be used in all kinds of curriculum. Um, if we build a Minecraft world together, what kinds of rules do we have? The physical uh, rules that are built into Minecraft allow us to break each other's stuff and kill things and, and build on top of each other and build explosives that will blow each other up. What kind of rules do we want to have inside our, our shared space? So I would say the long and the short of it is for those of you with parents, uh, those of you who are parents with kids who are um, getting obsessed with Minecraft, um, I think obsessed is probably the wrong word. What they're doing is exploring deeply a space um, that rewards deep exploration. Um, I've certainly enjoyed uh, my research in the world of Minecraft, uh, and if folks have thoughts or ideas or insights, I, I welcome you to share them in the comments, either in the YouTube video or at the EdTech Researcher page. So thanks for spending a little time with me in my virtual world, and uh, I will see you back.